You know, it's a privilege each week to be able to talk about these wonderful things. That's one of the joys of ministry, getting to live your life partly in these great stories. This is from the seventh chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. This is also told in the Gospel of Matthew. After Jesus had finished his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Capernaum was almost his hometown. Nazareth is not far from Capernaum. If Jesus worked with his father uh, in the carpentry work, they were possibly building things in Capernaum because there was almost nothing in uh, Nazareth except one small grocery store and a gas station. Well, in Nazareth was that kind of place that when the archaeologists dig there today, they find very, very little that is there. It's about as small as a town that could get without calling itself Camp Texas. Well, anyway, uh, there was a centurion there who had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. Now, our understanding is that his valuing of this slave is not for what the slave can do. An old translation simply says that he loved the slave. And this is, I think, the way we need to understand this. This is a person that he cared deeply about. This says that the slave was close to death. Matthew tells us that he was very ill and he was paralyzed. When this centurion, which was a Roman soldier who was over 100 men, when this centurion heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders. He himself was not Jewish, he was Gentile, but he sent some Jewish elders to Jesus asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, This man is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people and is he who built the synagogue for us, a synagogue in Capernaum. And Jesus went with them. But when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you but only speak the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another I say, come, and he comes, and to my slave I say, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel. Now remember he's saying this about a Gentile to a group of Jewish people gathered around him. I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Not even in Israel have I found anyone who has this level of trust. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant in good health. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now they went there to um, they went there to convince Jesus. The Jewish elders sent by this Gentile went there to convince Jesus that this man was worthy for Jesus to come. Really, and they had their speech already uh, prepared by the centurion. Tell him this, and uh, and they had their own uh, improvised version in which they had their own praise the man, but the centurion simply said, come, and actually, that was all that was necessary. I ate in a, a fairly nice restaurant in Dallas uh, this last week uh, called uh, Sissy's uh, Southern Kitchen, and they have a bread pudding there, and uh, uh, a waiter, I think, was explaining it to a customer. Uh, the bread pudding has uh, a whiskey and croissant bread and some raisins. He said, hold it. You had to get whiskey. So they had Jesus at come, he's needed, but they gave their speech anyway. Now we don't know a lot about the centurion. We don't know what he looked like. We don't know how tall he was. We don't even know what his name is. None of that has come down to us. But the truth is the character of the man has come down to us in this little bit that was shared with us there. The character of the man and certain other important characteristics. The fact that he, of course, is a Gentile and not a Jew. And Gentiles 
were looked down upon by the Jewish people. Anybody, uh, Judaism at that time was a very exclusive faith. It was hard to get into. Men had to be circumcised. And uh, it was a difficult thing for the rest of the world, although Judaism was uh, one of the most attractive faiths that anybody could come across. It was difficult, for, for, especially for men, to enter the faith. It was more likely that women, uh, Gentile women, would enter the, 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 the faith than it would be men because of this operation that they had to go through. So we know that this man was a Gentile and that he would have been looked down upon uh, by most of the Jewish people. We also know that our Lord looked down on no one. The second thing that we know about him is that he was uh, a seeker. Here's someone who was seeking God. I can't blame him for not being interested in his native religion of a Roman soldier. A Roman soldier. He was a man of great power and great wealth. Seemed like he was a smart man because he was interested in Jesus. But uh, uh, the reason we were in Dallas this week is we visited a display of, a, of, of Greek and Roman statuary. 200 pieces from antiquity. Some from around the time of Christ. Some from four or 500 years before. Some of the original Greek stuff and some Roman copies of Greek stuff because ever since the Greek chiseled out these uh, beautiful human forms, uh, the world has admired them and, and, and Rome copied them. But a lot of these forms were of their gods. Uh, 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 Zeus and, and Hera. And they're good looking people. But that's really all they were. They were people and they lived on Mount Olympus and they carried on like somebody in a soap opera. I mean, you know, one would marry one and then they'd break up and then they'd marry three or four and, then, and they would fight and they would war against each other. It was just this and, and that's the, re, the religion that was available to him. It was, a, it was a great thing for reducing statues. It wasn't much for, for, for reducing a relationship with God. Now, it's all that God had to work with with the Greek people. And God can work with whatever mess we give him. And that's the mess that they had before God. And God had to work with them through that. I'm not saying it had no value. But I'm saying I know why the Roman centurion, who was a man of deep compassion, why he would be seeking something else, and he had actually was so interested in the in the in the faith of uh, uh, Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob that he had uh, built a synagogue for the people. We know that he is a man of great power and great wealth, therefore, but but it is his heart that is showing through. That relationship he has with that servant, with that slave, is quite unusual. He valued him as a person. Someone who, for most people in his position, that person would have been expendable. He would be replaced with someone else. But he was irreplaceable for him. And his relationship with the Hebrew people was also a, a fascinating thing. They loved him. He, he was the law. He was the authority in this town. He either worked for Herod Antipas, and you know, the money was over the whole area. Or he worked, worked, for, worked for Pontius Pilate, and you know that name. And Pontius Pilate was not a particularly good guy. But this was a particularly good guy. And it's kind of fascinating to see his heart recorded here in this story. And to see Jesus responding to him, a Gentile, as someone who has an extraordinary kind of faith. And you and I are not really aware of the kind of, of crisis that is impending here. But uh, when this Jewish delegation uh, is, is headed back and, and word comes to the centurion that Jesus is actually coming to his door and coming to his house, this creates a moment of crisis for him. Because that means that this holy man is coming to the house of one who is unworthy. And also this holy man, if he stepped under a Gentile roof, would, <laughs> would lose any sanctification that he had, according to the Jewish people. He would become defiled. This was not the centurion's intention at all. He had not intended to 
impinge upon Jesus to, to make life harder for him. And the idea of this happening was something he could not bear. He said, no, no, no. Tell him, tell him to stop right where he is. Tell him to stop right where he is. Don't let him come any further. He said, because I know how this thing works. I know what the chain of command is. He was a military man. He knows that if you're high enough up in the ranks, you can say jump and somebody beneath you is going to say how high. And he also knew there was somebody over him who would say jump and he was the one who had to say how high. He said, I know. He said, I have people under me. And I say to them, do this, and they do it. I say to someone else, do that, and they do that. Stop him where he is. Because I know the chain of command. And tell him that I know that all he has to do is speak that word. Speak that word. And his will and God's will will be done in the life of my servant. So they rush back to Jesus and they stop him where he is. And says, he, he does not want you to come. He is not worthy. He does not want you to come under his roof. He wants you to stop right where you are because he understands how this works, he says. He's got people under him. He's got people above him. He knows where he is in the chain of command. And he knows where you are in the chain of command. And all you have to do is simply say that word and his servant will be healed. And Jesus as much as says, I am, I am astounded. He was touched by the trust. You know, there is a familiar prayer from scripture which says, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Prayer that is most useful for us as those who do believe and perhaps believe sufficiently is this one. Lord, I do trust, but help me to trust more deeply. Our trusting God is not going to make God do anything, but it does seem to open God's power in our lives because God will not push. God will not invade. God will call. God will surround us with love. But God expects us to open our lives. Since we in the chain of command are at the bottom of the heap and Jesus is at the top and he is the chain of command all the way from the top where he is down to the bottom where we are. He is our source. He is the power that we run on. He is the strength that we live on. I have to tell you this story although I've told it to you. I used to take the church paper over to Dallas. We had it printed at uh, the United Methodist Reporter, which has now gone out of business, but we used to, used to be the front page of the reporter and would go to everybody in church. They mailed it out, and the good thing about that is uh, they were the ones who had to fold, spindle, and mutilate it. We didn't have to do it here at the church. Well, anyway, they sent the paper out, and I took the copy over there once every two weeks. And there was an electric eye door gate on that place. And I never had any trouble getting in. I would pull up in my little red pickup. I've had that thing for a long time. And the gate would simply fly open for me and I would just push right in. I was always in a hurry. I'm not always in a hurry, but I've been in a hurry for the last 20 years. But anyway, I was in a hurry at that time, always on those days. We wanted to get back over here. And 
I would park around at the side of the building. And when I started to leave and pulled around and pulled up to that side of the gate, just as I pulled up to the other side to get in, it would never break the beam. And I couldn't get out. And I would, I would sit there waiting. And sometimes if I sat there long enough, somebody else would pull up and knew how to do it. And they would pull up and it would, it would open then. Or I would just sit around beside the building thinking, well, I, I don't know what the secret is. I'll just sit here and I'll just tailgate somebody else who comes through. That went on for months. Then I thought, I'm going to get the knack of this come one way or another. I'm going to figure it out. So there was the day that came when I was determined I was going to give it the time. I thought I'm smart enough to do this. My pickup, my pickup, it's a Toyota. It's smart enough to do this. I pulled up to the gate and I thought I'm going to figure it out. It didn't open. I thought, well, you may have to come up with it. Other people kind of come up from the right. I thought you may have to just hit it with that right fender. It must be picky. So I pulled back to the right and took a run at it, and I came up, and I hit it just with that right foot. Don't rush it. Don't scare it. You hit it just with that right fender. Maybe just the headlight. I, I wasn't sure. And when I did that, that gate just flew open. I did it that way for three or four weeks. But you know how it is when you get good at something? There's a kind of pride that sits in. And I just had to do a little bragging. Usually I just ran in and threw my coffee down and left out. I, sometimes I didn't even see anybody. But I had to say this to the receptionist. I said, you know, I've got the hang of it. What have you got the hang of? I've got the hang of that gate out there. I, I said, I, I used to, I guess I, was just, I used to be a klutz. I used to be an idiot. I just didn't know how to do it. But now I said, I have figured it out and I can open that gate every time. She said, no, you can't. I said, yes, I can. I said, she said, not hurt me. But she said again, no, you can't. From the inside, she said, that gate is controlled by this button on my desk. <laughs> so I was still the klutz. She said, you have no power over the only reason it works that way when you pull back this way is because then I can see you. Here we are, you know. We're trying to do it on our own. Hands off, everybody. I've got it covered. Here we are, low man, low woman on the totem pole. And we've got it covered. Here we are with our puny powers and all of the powers of heaven available to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we say, we've got it covered. Remember that TV commercial? It was for some headache remedy. Someone comes in the kitchen to help this woman who's all flustered and she drops a pan and she says, I'd rather do it myself. Let's not tell God that anymore. Let you and me tell God, I know the chain of command and I know where I fit into it. And I know how you love me and because I know how you love me, I trust you with my life. I may have dragged it this way and dragged it that way and pushed and pulled, 
But I'm going to take some of that out of it now, and I'm going to let you leave me. I'm going to, I'm going to surrender. I'm going to surrender. I'm going to surrender my heart to you who loves me. And I'm not going to worry about it anymore. I'm going to know that where I need to be, you, Lord, can leave me. I know the chain of command. I know my place in it. And you are just waiting to lift me, to lift me, to lift me up. No, we don't. 